Hello team, and welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan M.S. Pierce. This is a Ukraine War Update Extra video, giving you the extra tidbits to get your teeth into to give you a greater understanding of the war in Ukraine. I'm going to go first to a comment someone has posted on one of my threads, uh, I think a useful anecdotal comment from uh, Cheng Cheng or Seng Seng. Uh, my father was a Marine in World War II. After the war, he spent the rest of his life studying World War II. I once asked him why he spent so much time studying the Pacific War when he was there. He said, because I was a grunt. They didn't tell us anything about what was going on. Just over the hill from me, historic battles were taking place, and I did not find out until 50 years later from a book. Point is, Take soldiers on the front lines, perceptions and reports with a big bag of salt. They often do not know what is going on around them beyond the guy to the left or right of them. And they should not know what is going on for operational security reasons. It's all above their pay grade. This is a really good point. So I read out uh, excerpts from an article of uh, supposedly poorly trained, uh, mobilised troops sent to... Bakhmut to the front line there and it's easy to extrapolate what they were feeding onto everyone um, and what the reasoning might have been etc etc but that can be a dangerous pastime because these guys might not be so connected to the guys over the hill they might or, or in, in in the next unit they they might not be representative they might not know what's going on they and yet they're given their opinion uh, trying to piece together what they think is happening, but but it's, it, that can be uh, a little bit dodgy to maybe um, you know, seek uh, an understanding of a war from a macro level by speaking to the people at the micro level. Anyway, I uh, just thought that's a useful comment. Thanks for that. So this is a bit of video footage about a new ISDM Zemledelaya, uh, which was about to open fire when a Ukrainian drone hit it with a grenade um uh and then the payload exploded because of course we want to hear that music so it's been hit with one ied dropped from a drone and that's caused it uh some pretty significant damage and then they drop another one for good measure and this really cooks off the munitions on board and i'll show you this before telling you what this uh, piece of equipment actually is i mean you can see it there it looks like a gmlrs so they drop that and then bang that is a pretty significant explosion and that ain't coming home to be repaired i don't think so what is this bit of kit well it's a relatively new piece of kit for the first time russians lost their uh, isdm zemledelaya remote mine laying system and that's a video you've just seen so this is a vehicle was destroyed with ammunition dropped from a drone um as the National Guard noted, the Russian Tor one M uh, sorry, Tor M1 air defense system was struck in the same way. So they they are hitting some fairly significant stuff at the moment. Uh, these thermobaric uh, uh, launches have been hit. A few of them have been taken out uh, with drones. One was hit actually with with a kamikaze drone recently. Um, so what is this? Well, it's actually, uh, as I said, it's the first case of this being being hit. Uh, these are a fairly new system. It's preliminary tests were completed in 2022. And this year it was also publicly demonstrated for the first time. The main task of the system is to create minefields at a distance of 5 to 15 kilometers by launching rocket propelled 122 millimeter projectiles. One vehicle has two blocks of 25 guides overall, uh, which mine the defined area. So they are these. Mines, I've done a few segments on mines recently, are a hugely important component to the war at the moment. You look down at Vukladan, the amount of equipment that's been lost for the Russians, that's been Ukrainian mines taking those vehicles out really significantly. But when we're talking about the counter-offensives that, that appear to be gearing up to take place for the Ukrainians in a couple of months' time, one could be forgiven for thinking they're going to come a cropper or at least face some stiff obstructions in the form of mines. And if Russia are mining vast swathes of land, uh, which I'm sure they are, 
in wherever they think the counter-offensive will take place. And that will be a real challenge. I mean, you don't want to get all this brilliant equipment from from around the world, from allies. You know, you don't want to commit these Leopard 2s and Challenger 2s and Bradley IFs and send them all, go, yeah, hurrah, send them all in, and they just hit, get hit by mine after mine after mine. Um, there's going to be some serious need for a- armoured engineering vehicles to demine uh, a lot of places. But the problem is you don't want to, you know, sending in your demining vehicles first uh, is not particularly offensive. I mean, they can then be picked off by the defences that are there. So it's, it's really difficult to get an offensive right where you are being offensive, uh, but at the same time safe from, uh, you know, the the threat of mines. Uh, keeping on the Russians, here's some video footage apparently showing nighttime artillery strikes on Seversk. So Seversk is north of Bakhmut and is quite an important uh, potential target. Or I mean, of course, it is a target for Russia because they want all of Donbass. But this is uh, this is well defended, I believe, city to the north of of Bakhmut. Anyway, there. This footage suggests that they the Russians are doing nocturnal. Attacks, nighttime attacks, artillery strikes on Ukrainian positions. I can't verify that claim. Uh, I can verify that's ACDC. Uh, but I can't verify that the, where that is and et cetera, et cetera. But if we take the video uh, for granted, then you know I wonder whether you're starting to see Russia add a couple of extra elements of capability into their warfare at the moment. Uh, as I see that that mine laying uh, piece of equipment that we just seen, new to the battlefield, the tornado um, guided launch uh, GML Gimlers guided missile launch rocket system uh, that I talked about in the previous segment that has a much longer range. Is, is that uh, able to be brought to the front line? Do they have many of them? Do they have the munitions for them? And here we've got no- nocturnal artillery strikes. You know, are, are Russia being able to flex a little bit more with some of their pieces of equipment, or are these just really uh, rare occurrences of uh, some half decent stuff? Um, right, we're going to move on to propagandists. Uh, and I, I did mention this, I actually recorded this a couple of days ago, but I've scrapped that because the audio is a bit rubbish uh so uh, here is a an example of how narrative has shifted uh we have propagandists talking here that perhaps time isn't on russia's side we've heard before plenty that putin wants the war to last as long as possible because that plays into the russian hands Ukraine's allies may get bored and give up supporting and have other things to worry about and the money ends up being too much and so on and so forth. Uh, but these propagandists, some of them are are starting to voice opinions that, that we haven't really heard before. And here's one that, that actually time isn't on their side. So whose side is time on now? Ukraine's or ours? She asks. And the response is, it seems to me that with every supply, with every transfer of Western weaponry, the armed forces of Ukraine are gaining more offensive, operational and combat capabilities. So time is now on their side. We need to end this conflict, in my opinion, as soon as possible. Now, that is, I think, quite significant. You're starting to see alternative viewpoints, perhaps, on news channels, on these propaganda uh, shows and I don't know if that is intentional like there's some kind of psyops thing going on here where they're trying to muddy the information space with lots of competing narratives and so you're so confused you just don't know who to believe and then you know, eventually the the Kremlin kind of wades through that that those murky waters to provide the solution or or whether this is genuinely people starting to think do you know what Ukraine are being provided an awful lot of stuff and if the longer this lasts the more stuff they're going to get given and the worse it's going to be for for Russia so if we're going to do something we need to do it now again the question is where is that stuff where is that equipment 
Uh, this is going back to, to the same uh, propagandist, uh, and this is playing on the idea, uh, it's absolutely ridiculous, uh, <laughs> playing on the idea that we've had some food shortages in the UK. I think this is where, where she's going. Uh, we have had some food shortages with certain salad. I mean, I haven't. No, no one I know has. But in some supermarkets, there's been a shortage because apparently uh, certain places have had, been affected by weather. Spain and other places are, where we get a lot of out-of-season uh, salad, you know, lettuces and tomatoes and whatnot ha have had their their growing affected uh, and so we have had a, a lack of supply there's also some people blaming brexit and so on and so forth but it's not like you know i mean i've not noticed this one iota i've just seen a few bits on the news um but they've kind of taken this and run with it. And apparently now in Britain, we can't get food, so we're all eating squirrels. It's just <laughs> ridiculous. Anyway, so what does she say? Today, it was revealed that some restaurants in once Great Britain, once Great Britain will be serving squirrels. I mean, she's probably read something in some, uh, you know. And finally, the news report says, and finally, this restaurant has decided to serve squirrels. Some kind of like weird thing that a restaurant is doing. But that's not going to be representative and... Oh, Goodness knows what she's talking about. Anyway, or apparently there's a restaurant. Uh, some some restaurants in once Great Britain will be serving will be serving squirrels. Will they though? Uh, what are you talking about? Um, uh, in fact, I might just go and Google that in a second. Uh, and she continues. Oh, come on. Uh, by saying, in view of the fact that there are plenty of animals in the parks, why not eat them? Bearing in mind the food shortage. Uh, but they're not backing down from the decision to help Zelensky to supply weapons. So this is the idea that, you know, as she goes on to say, uh, that is they will eat squirrels but still supply howitzers, not to get our hopes up uh, about the protests. Uh, so apparently, you know, how terrible the UK was still providing howitzers even though we can't feed ourselves and we're all eating squirrels is generally the point now. I mean, it's absolute garbage. Uh, but that's Russian propaganda for you, right? So I think this is it. So th this is just uh, an article in iNews talking about squirrels. Do you, anyone, local restaurants urge to put grey squirrels on the menu after Woodland Cull? Right. So this is actually just an ecosystem thing. UK have had grey squirrels that have come over from America and they've basically outcompeted our indigenous red squirrels that only really exist on Brownsea Island uh, in, in South Dorset on uh, the Isle of Wight. Actually, just I can see the Isle of Wight almost in my house. Uh, and up in sort of Northumberland area. So they've been pushed out. The, my dad hates grey squirrels, right? So he's just, he's always tried to catch them uh, and kill them. But he's, he's, not, he's not a fan of grey squirrels. Uh, but nonetheless, this is just a, an ecological thing, which is, so they're going to try and cull a load of grey squirrels uh, to give the red squirrels a, a chance to, to get some territory back. Uh, and what do you do with the grey squirrels? Well, you, just, you can just throw them away, or can you actually put them to use by eating them? You know, if they, if these are, you know, as you could eat wood pigeon or whatever. Can you eat squirrels? Uh, is that, you know, it's waste not, want not, I guess. But this is being interpreted by, I think, uh, the Russian propagandists as saying, oh my goodness, you know, Russian TV propagandists claims British people are eating squirrels because of food shortages, which is absolute garbage of the highest level uh, but there you go um right moving on to th the news piece th that i shared with you that the um, um ukrainian soldier was executed by russians he was captured he was basically a pow they commanded him to do something he just said glory to ukraine and so they shot him they executed him, and it was a horrific video, and that's gone viral, and loads of people up in arms about that. And I've talked to you. I'm going to bore you again. Um, sorry about this, but I'm going to talk about cognitive dissonance reduction, which is where you have a core belief in your mind. Uh, in this case, it's going to be something like Russians are great, Russia is correct, Russia is morally right. So I'm talking from a Russian point of view here. And then you have a, a, a evidence that comes into your mind that contradicts that core belief. So what happens? This is called cognitive dissonance because you have a dissonance, a disharmony between these two competing things here, like your core belief and evidence against that core belief. You can either reject that wholesale. So some people just reject evidence. They bury their head in their sands or they they they, they do things like shoot the messenger. You, you slag off where the evidence has come from uh, and therefore you devalue the evidence 
and you maintain your your uh, core belief or you adapt the evidence to fit your core belief and you warp the evidence arguably so on and so forth uh, what you very rarely do is adapt your core belief to the evidence so people don't like changing their mind so you would generally you very rarely change your mind uh, and if you do it's quite a can be quite a seismic shift so that's a real rarity and when you when you have a really important core belief which is like i am a member of a country and my country is good and right and we've gone to war and this is good and right and proper and you know by by undoing that you're changing your entire worldview on your history your culture your place in the world all sorts of stuff you know who your country is who you believe putin is etc cetera, etc cetera. so th it's highly unlikely that that's going to shift so when you get a piece of evidence which is our soldiers have just shot this POW in a war crime, and you can't contest that that happened. There's video evidence of that of of a person getting shot. Right? What do you do to maintain this? And this is really interesting because actually here here's a number of different responses. So these are responses, just a typical cross section of Russian people responding on social media to that. So Eurocucks will be sharing this video hinting that Russians are demons. Yes, we are. So the way they this person is dealing with it is like, yeah, deal with it. We shot him. So that's what that okay. That's but actually what they often do with that is devalue that person's life so that they are less than human. This is happening in the Second World War. The, the work of uh, Stanley Milgram in the Milgram experiments, uh Philip Zimbardo in the uh, Stanford prison experiments and so on and so forth after the second world war looked at how good people did bad things so how do people uh, follow orders to condemn huge amounts of Jews to death to, to literally kill them in these gas chambers and so on and so forth and shoot them so it's I was just following orders now we know actually in the Nuremberg trials that doesn't stand up as an answer you can't you can't use that anymore well, you can't use that, that, that that's not defense but a lot of people do that's the the milgram experiments showed that that's a really common thing you know if someone in authority tells you to do something uh, you you can end up doing a really bad thing you know if it's an authority figure that tells you but anyway uh, the other these experiments also all experience experiments also showed that we are quite close to being dark uh, it doesn't take much to tip us over um let's see the stanford prison experiment showed that um, so on and so forth, but but there will be a lot of devaluing that person's life to the point where he's not human. This is what happened with the the, with the Nazis and and Jews. It's like if if you treat them like rats or like non non humans, they're less than. Then it excuses being able to do anything to them. Anyway, so someone says wasted too many bullets. Shame should have put one in the stomach and left in the ditch. So this is all about dehumanizing. This the like. You wouldn't be saying things like that if you felt that these were humans who, whose lives were valuable uh, and like you. Um, this is what Americans and Anglo-Saxons wanted. You can stop it now. Now, at the end, either they, us, or we, them. That's it. As blaming the Americans and Anglo-Saxons uh, rather than looking at this as a, as a thing. It's like, oh, this is the Americans' fault. So kind of form of burying your head in the sand to that actual incident and just looking at it as a whole uh should be doing this to everyone again dehumanizing them in order to to justify that more of content like that uh f brutal so this is an interesting nuance slightly nuanced one brutal brutal like cannibals could have beaten him but why kill in in the comments they say he took part in tortures but shouldn't have effing killed him so this is the idea that someone's actually said no i don't think we should have killed them however you know, he did torture. Now, this is so how so go, coming back to these ideas, how do we justify this evidence? How do we how do we justify the, the shooting someone like that? And so there have been claims from Russians that that guy was a without any evidence at all that that guy tortured Russians in captivity himself. Like he was a, he was a torturer. And so therefore, well, he's he got what was coming to him. And again, that's how you justify that. And your core belief remains that Russia are the good and, and right people. Uh, should always be like that soon with every Ukrainian captive. So there's there's the, these reactions that that generally uh, maintain us being strong, 
us being Russians, I'm speaking from a Russian point of view here, being strong and right, and that actually these guys just had what they're coming, had what they deserved. They 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 are less than. And then Dmitry War Translated adds to this: if you want to know roughly what discussions the murder of a Ukrainian POW caused in Russian channels, it's basically two camps: Nazis, Grey Zone top ads, Russish. Uh, who believe it should not be ashamed of denying Russian involvement. So this is kind of like, yeah, we don't deny it. that happened, um, but it's going to be that kind of Nazi way of doing it, which is Ukrainians, uh, they'll call them the Kokos, I think it is, which is a, a really defamatory way of speaking about them and saying, you know, they, they should be killed uh, and they're basically less than. And I'm not saying Ukrainians don't do this to Russians as well. There are ways of that's how you do war that's how you deal with being able to shoot other people however when you've captured them it seems that ukrainians are uh, ostensibly um more likely to adhere to the international rules of conflict um uh, the other way he says and more officially aligned channels whose only effort is trying to present the soldier as a russian pow so this is like okay how do we how do we do this right even though he's wearing i think the insignia of of he's wearing the ukrainian flag on his shoulder he's he must have nicked that or something he's actually a russian pow and these are these are ukrainians shooting him and that maintains your core belief that the russians are correct there is no middle ground he says no one even suggests that they could have made a mistake or condemns the crime in other words that core belief maintains nothing will challenge that and they'll do all sorts of things to get rid of this or to adapt it to that uh, but it will never be a case of uh, of changing your core belief to adapt to the new evidence uh, very rarely happens um, okay, moving on from that, we're going to go to this is this isn't like an anti-Trump trade, but although I'm going to be critical of him, uh, and rightfully so, but this is moving on to talking about something else. So it's a useful segue into something else. So Fox News, Sean Hannity interviewed Trump on radio, and he said some pretty controversial stuff, which is. Um, well, the headline here in Yahoo News is Fox News edits out Trump saying he might have let Russia take over parts of Ukraine. Uh, so he were in a radio interview, uh, Trump revealed how he personally would have prevented war. According to Trump, all he needed to do was let Russia take over parts of Ukraine. Um, saying uh, that Russia was going for the whole enchilada with Joe Biden as president, Trump added that Russia took over nothing while he was in the White House because Russian President Vladimir Putin understood uh, that he would never have done it. And of course, there's lots of arguments over that, whether that is is at all would have been the case. And I, I argue vociferously that wouldn't have been. The former president then added, that's without even negotiating a deal. I could have negotiated. At worst, I could have made a deal to take over something. Uh, there are certain areas that are Russian-speaking areas, frankly, but you could have worked a deal. Uh, and this is your classic Russian appeasement. This is your Putin appeasement. And uh, this is kind of what Musk has said, but what many others have said who have been on the side of doing peace in order to stop the war to give Russia kind of what they want. And it's going back to the idea, and this is what I'm going to speak about in a second. This is a segue. It's, it's like the idea that Russian speaking means uh, that, that, that they're Russian and they're pro-Russia necessarily. And that's just not the case. Uh, and he said, in, instead, shortly, shortly after Trump says, I couldn't. Right. So what happens is, is then Fox later or the radio show later I uh, just cut that out. And the, the, later, when they had that segment, they said Trump saying, I could have negotiated. And then the audio skips 30 seconds to him talking about uh, China again. Uh, but in recent weeks, Trump has repeatedly bragged that it would be easy, quote, easy to end the crisis, claiming that it would only take him a single day to reach a peace deal between Russia and Ukraine. Quote, we could end the Ukraine conflict in 24 hours with the right leadership, he's declared absolute bravado that and just is just not that's not going to happen that is not true this is hugely complicated and the only way you would end it within a day is basically saying to russia we aren't going to help ukraine anymore you can have what you like russia uh, uh, so on and so forth but it won't end it because ukraine won't allow that so they will fight to their death so you, it's just a complete inaccurate understanding of what's going on there like ukraine would never would never do a deal within a day the only deal ukraine would accept within a day would be russia agreeing to get the hell out of ukraine and putin will not do that so it's just 
utter nonsense. It's BS to say that. And as you can tell, I'm getting annoyed because this is really counterproductive. This kind of narrative and this rhetoric is counterproductive. And, and, and I'm really not a fan of it. Um, anyway, uh, this was leading on to th this. So this is someone having to go at NBC News. Right, so the other end of the spectrum here, or there or thereabouts, that published a piece on Ukrainian Crimea, but it's really easy to fall into the trap of Ukraine. Sentiment in Crimea is pro-Russian. They speak Russian, blah, 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 blah. Therefore, you know, things are difficult. And, and I've said this before, but only in a, in a practical way. It's like, if Ukraine win the war, what do you do with Crimea? What do you do with the Donbass? Because there are a lot of pro-Russians, there are a lot of Russian speakers there, and there is a lot of sentiment for pro, you know, anti-Ukraine. The question is, why is that? Well, they broadly are Russian. They've been drafted in 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 massive, you know, train loads into these places, and the people who were pro-Ukrainian have fled, and so you get a distorted idea of what the Donbass and what the Crimea are. And people like Trump and Elon Musk will look at that, plus look at really old stats before the war started, like uh, Musk did in his, his recourse to the 2012 um, opinion polls on on whether people in Crimea would like to you know, be part of Russia. And it's like that was before the Maidan, that was before the war started back in 2014 and certainly before 2022. So just completely uh, problematic to, to use that data. But anyway, here... I digress. When publishing a piece on Ukrainian Crimea, which has been illegally occupied in, by Russia since 2014, and saying that most people you interviewed were pro-Russian, so this is what NBC had said, you might want to add some crucial context. Context, context, context. One, thousands of residents fled Crimea after the occupation. Two, many of those who opposed Russia's illegal occupation were jailed. Some of the most high-profile cases include Ole Sentsov and Alexander Kolchenko, look them up. Crimean Tatars, the indigenous people of the peninsula, continue to be repressed for their pro-Ukrainian position. Three, according to different estimates, Russia moved from 500,000 to 1 million Russian residents to Crimea since 2014. So if you're driving around Crimea interviewing people, I wonder what uh, opinion they're going to have. Without this context, your piece justifies Russia's occupation and presents Ukraine as an aggressor who wants to capture territory against its residents' will. Ask those who had to flee, who were jailed, whether they want their land to be part of Ukraine, where they can live freely. And one more thing, travelling to Crimea through the Russian territory is not cool. Your crew won't be allowed to, uh, to enter Ukraine from now on, FYI. Uh, and then see, this then feeds back to these kind of opinions. It's like if you had the right context for, um, you know, for right understanding, the right knowledge about actually what's going on in Crimea and in, in the Donbass or what's happened historically since sort of, 2008 onwards 2012 you know 2014 then you you might have different opinions about you know what's going on there and that 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 applies to to, to many people from NBC to Trump to Musk so on and so forth it, it it is difficult and Ukraine winning the war working out what to do with Crimea and the Donbass will be a really difficult uh, puzzle, and I I would imagine I'd imagine a lot of Russians would leave, uh, as we have already seen. We've seen a number of Russians leave Crimea when the Kerch Bridge went down, uh, when they were starting to get a few more hits within Crimea. Sevastopol was hit by drones. You started to get a flow of Russians out there in the same way that you've seen a flow of Russians out of Georgia in the last forty eight hours, apparently by road you know they 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 go into these places for certain reasons in, in with the crime in the crime case of Crimea, it's the russians shipping them in because th that is their way of of establishing a place with a russian identity to ship a load of russians in um how how do you how do you rectify that situation that's going to be difficult um anyway uh that's uh enough from me for today hopefully that was a, a a bunch of useful talking points uh, if you disagree with what i say please you know let me know how and why uh, that'd be fantastic uh, otherwise you can 
help support the channel by popping onto uasupporters.com forward slash ATP. That would be brilliant. Really would appreciate that and get anything from there and small amount of commission goes to my channel or all the ways that you can support the channel are in the description below. Buy me a coffee and a PayPal and all those things. But just being there and contributing so brilliantly to the uh, thread is amazing. So thank you. Uh, anyway, take care. Speak soon.